Welcome to the MSC Nastran version 2022.2 What's New presentation. In this presentation, we'll review some of the new capabilities now available in this latest release of the product in the areas of high performance computing, nonlinear, rotor dynamics, composites, modeling, ENVH, results, and fatigue. The presentation is given by MSC Nastran product development and each section presented by the developer responsible for the project. This project is for ACMS uh, robustness and error message improvements. Everything we're talking about uh, briefly today, uh, there's a, um, some additional error handling for ACMS error conditions and a new user's guide. Uh, we're changing a default to the massless mechanism method when, uh, when we have massless mechanisms in the model. Uh, there's a new output file this gets generated if you do have massless mechanisms in your model. Uh, there's a new case control command that's related to all of this called solid skin. I will describe that and then we'll talk a little bit about future work. As we know, uh, ACMS is very widely used, especially in auto industry, and uh, there are large complicated models, very large models that we're familiar with uh, that are used, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 million degrees of freedom is typical, uh, large frequency ranges for frequency response, etc. The way these models are assembled uh, sometimes is by various different groups, and this can lead to uh, modeling mistakes. Uh, some of them are significant and some of them are not significant modeling mistakes. But and what happens but, is, of course, some modeling errors are not caught by the user until they're actually running Nastran and uh, there's some part, some small part of the model that's not properly constrained. It's moving somehow and that's where we have to come in and help the user understand what's happening. Why is Nastran not able to solve? A particular model. The challenge that we have, uh, there's a couple of challenges. Uh, number one is that these problems with become uh, singular in nature or nearly singular are difficult to diagnose because just of the nature of the mathematics and the uh, um, dealing with very large or very small numbers and how to trace that back to um, the mo to the model in a meaningful way for the user. Um, should we stop and uh, provide as much diagnostic as we can, or should uh, should the job try to continue and provide some results? What we do know is that ACMS in particular is less forgiving, and even if you just simply run Lanchos, sometimes Lanchos, the whole uh, without ACMS will run through and give a result, whereas a, a running ACMS on a model that may have some singularity to it uh, will will sometimes fail. And not only that, it'll fail with error messages that are less than helpful. So uh, with, for this project, we want to upgrade the robustness in general in terms of all these issues, uh, improve the messaging, um, implement some new user convenience features and a new user guide. Uh, in terms of the uh, ACMS error handling, Assuming now that we have a model that has massless mechanisms, there's a process that's not new that we uh, engage to detect, identify, and constrain automatically any um, singularities, right? So um, whenever the ACMS1 module produces error messages, uh, in the past, these have not been particularly helpful. Uh, so we've tried to improve the text there and make it less confusing and provide a little bit more information that's more meaningful. So we're now issuing a different message in this condition. And it says uh, specifically that a numerical singularity is encountered during the component solution. And we try to provide more information there in that message. And then also what has happened in the past is when we try to uh, hunt for massless mechanism and fail, or in the case where we actually do find massless mechanisms and constrain the model and then reanalyze, then that solution can also fail. Again, this is because trying to analyze a, a nearly singular model is, is difficult. But in those two conditions, 
uh, Nastran would sometimes continue and then fail downstream with a really confusing message and it didn't make any sense to any, any user. So we finally were able to trap that condition where you know we're just not able to solve the problem for one reason or another. And we issue a new uh, user fatal message 9117 and here's the text. And then at this point, we actually go back and query. There's a little database of warning messages that gets built during an Astrand run, and uh, we survey those messages to try to find warnings that are relevant. So maybe the user can go back and look, uh, because sometimes, as we know, the user may not go look back at a ZFO6 printed output file. It might be very large, so. What we do is at the end of the run, this might be very visible to the user, this fatal message and say, hey, go back and look at these warnings because there may be something there that's useful, maybe some some uh, some mis misguided properties or some other missing information that is causing the numerical issue here. So, so we've made some effort here to improve the messaging. Um, it's always uh, a work in progress and uh, based on feedback we're getting, we would get Again, from this new version, we can make more improvements. Also, we have a new user manual uh, added to the collection of Nastran documentation. We, uh, we understand that uh, our competitors have one central user guide, whereas with, with ACMS, a lot of the information was scattered in the, Q, in the QRG or the release guides or HPC manual, different chapters, so we decided to extract all that information into a central user's manual and I, a user guide. I encourage everybody to look at it. Um, here is the, uh, for version one of this manual, here's the table of contents. You can see um, we have guidelines, HPC best practices. We talk about restarts, Get lots of questions about how to do uh, restarts from SAW 103 to 111 or 112, and that's all in there. Some general troubleshooting. We talk about FASTFR, which is also not strictly an ACMS topic, but it's closely tied to uh, ACMS usage and frequency response. Uh, this is the first version of this manual. We will certainly be enhancing it and adding to it. Please send comments and uh, questions and uh, we'll be happy to make this uh, a very useful document for our user community. Next is this uh, parameter massless mechanism method. So we have different methods for searching for a massless mechanism in the in a model. The original one was we've we've relegated to the old method and we have a new method and a beta method. So what we've discovered is generally the beta method is a little bit more reliable, a little bit more robust. So just a simple change in order to help things along here in this in this whole project, we've made the change of uh, the default of this method to the beta method. There are some references where we discuss what is a massless mechanism, how do we look for them, some of the mathematics involved and some of the challenges are described in these references here. That I've listed. Okay, now for the case where we find massless mechanisms in a model, we are now outputting a new output file along with the .f06 and .f04 and .op2, etc. Now there's a new output file that has the base name or the output file name with .singularity.bdf appended. And what does that have in it? Well, here's what happens currently when you see uh, uh, massless mechanisms. We print this user info 9146, and then this matgpr printout prints actually in the F06 file the degree of freedom and component information that we have found that are suspected of being uh, unconstrained. And this is what's going to be constrained, and we're going to rerun the analysis. Uh, many times it's users don't look at the FO6 file or this this information, even though it's there, is not easy to to digest. You know, how do you go find some of these grid points? Here's a collection of something like 12 grid points. So for convenience, 
we now kick these grid points out into a separate file and, and generate a set one bulk data entry card image. So you'll get a new uh, information message saying that, you know, we've created this physical file and this is the name of it. And, uh, and the contents, for example, are shown here in a set one. And we hardwire this uh, set ID because I guess this is unlikely to be picked by a user. So we set this set ID and just simply list the grid, list the grid points. And what's the purpose of this? The purpose is that then the user may go back and import this set one command into the bulk data, read it into the model now, and be able to plot that uh, th that collection of grid points in a convenient fashion to highlight what may be happening at those grid points or near those grid points in the model. Something is not fastened down correctly, it's wobbling or wiggling or something. So the whole idea, again, is a user convenience feature so they can easily visualize what Nastran is complaining about, try to get, try to get some help to the user. We do have a uh, new case control command. Solid skinning is a practice where a solid part of, this, of the structure may be skinned with shell elements. And there's a typical situation that comes about where if the membrane, uh, excuse me, if the bending properties are defined for those shells, that can, they can generate a very small stiffness, very little stiffness, and that can generate some singularities. And we've seen that that can trigger all the massless mechanism hunting and all those sorts of things for uh, making a singular model. We have a new case control command where you can automatically specify a property such that those elements defined with those properties will have membrane only defined uh, for, for those elements and then we avoid this problem uh, altogether. There is uh, a simple uh, case control command you can have a tolerance, you can specify very carefully if you have a PID, a property ID. And here's a simple test case. You can visualize what's happening here. And here's just an example of the uh, appropriate entries that get uh, manipulated. So finally, uh, with some future considerations, we would want to continue improving the, the underlying mathematical kernels inside the ACMS reduction to maybe make them a little bit more tolerant of some singularities, some small singularity, just for the case where if there is a massless mechanism, maybe it really doesn't affect the outcome of the model and hunting for them and constraining them is, is uh, sort of overkill. So maybe the ACMS reduction itself can be a bit more forgiving. And in those cases where uh, there's a mild singularity, the job will run through correctly uh, the first time. Uh, we also are are engaging in uh, an extensive research to try to improve when there are massless mechanisms a little bit more reliable and uh, robust process there to identify the correct and uh, the correct degrees of freedom uh, and which again it's a difficult problem to solve but uh, we're putting some quite a bit of research into that problem itself Yeah, today I'm going to uh, introduce the couple most performance improvements. So let me introduce the what's the couple most first uh, briefly uh, for the structure and fluid couple modes uh, for the coupled system that there is the stiffening effect on the surface where the fluid cavity touches the structural elements. So then uh, the inertia of the fluid will increase the mass of the structure. Uh, usually for the light cavity, like gas, air, these effects are small. So uncoupled analysis is enough to uh, cover the response of the coupled system. When the fluid is heavy, like gasoline or water, these effects cannot be ignored. So, and also uh, this coupling behavior makes the eigenvalue problem asymmetric. So. Before 2019 version, the only possible way to solve this unsymmetric eigenvalue problem was a solution 107. And since 2019 version, we introduced the rear coupled modes capability in solution 103, 111, and 112. And later then, we introduced the external super element generation and also 
the Adams flexible body and AVL component computation uh, using uh, the component based model, mod, component model basis method. And also we uh, introduced the model dynamic response analysis with the exterior acoustic problem in both uh, weakly coupled and strongly coupled way using these couple modes. So that was the history of the couple mode analysis. And in 2022.2, we introduced the additional acceleration method. Since 2019 version, it's been used this couple mode analysis in a very various uh, industries like aerospace, rocket engine, or automotive uh, powertrain models. And but the couple mode computation is using the subspace iteration method, but there was no any additional acceleration method since then. So usually for the large size of problems, the large number of iteration has been required to converge the problem. So we wanted to reduce that number of iteration uh, using this model basis initial vector method. Uh, which was introduced in uh, 2022.2 release. And also we extended these rear couple modes feature in solution 200 and 400 only for the uh, linear analysis at this moment. Uh, the user interface is simple. By comparing the standard method uh, using one single method coupled case control, for this acceleration method, we add two additional method uh, structure and fluid case control along with method coupled. And this method structure and method fluid case control will introduce this model basis uh, starting vector computation. And we also require uh, its corresponding IGAL or IGAL card for each uh, method case controls. By using this acceleration method, I want to show uh, how the performance improvement showing in the model. This model includes the 3 million size of degree of freedom and requested the eigenvalues up to 15,000 Hertz. And it's the frequency response analysis problem. So it requested about 16,000 uh, 16 frequencies. So I'm running this job uh, using SMP16 and memory uh, 1.2 terabyte in the HPC node. And I'm comparing the performance using the standard method versus this model acceleration method. With the standard method, we see about 500 minutes to complete the job. But with this model basis acceleration method, we had more than 50% reduced in performance time, so about less than 250 minutes to complete the job. And I want to uh, note that for the model basis method, we used the ACMS, but this ACMS is not using for the couple mode computation. Actually, it's only used, used for the uncoupled structure and fluid mode computation for this starting vector calculation. So when ACMS is used for the standard method, it will fade out because the couple modes itself does not support with ACMS yet. And also uh, the setting for the structure and fluid uncoupled modes for the number of modes or the high frequency range should be a little bit above of the couple modes requested. So for this example, I said V2 for the structure and V2 for the fluid modes were a little bit higher than the original couple modes requested. And there is a little limitation for the small problems. This acceleration method might not be efficient because it requires additional starting vector computation using this uncoupled modes for the structure and fluid. So this additional computation time 
might hurt the small problem size performance issue. So we usually recommend this acceleration method for the large size problem, more than like more 1 million degree of freedom case. And also you can use ACMS method, as I mentioned, but that's going to be only used for the model basis initial vector computation. And this performance enhancement only supports for the regular standard uh, rear couple modes at this moment, not for the external super element component model base. So yeah, in this release, we will introduce this uh, segment to segment nodal penalty method uh, that can be used in the permanent rule analysis. Yeah, this uh, nodal penalty method is actually an enhancement on top of our uh, existing segment to segment method. So a little bit uh, theory background. So here, this is a, a weak form in the variation uh, function. So uh, the equation, uh, we're still using this penalty formulation. And here, says this is du1 is the displacement field in the on the touching side, and the m side is and use uh, the displacement field on the touch side. And uh, this is essentially the equation. Uh, sorry, the matrix we constructed that going to be used in the equation to solve. So this part, this is the actually the our contact matrix that coming out with this nodal penalty formulation. Yeah, in terms of the permanent glue, of course, our contact matrix is built initially and has never been updated uh, as the uh, following analysis goes so, And we we'll support this uh, nodal penalty method in this release in 400 and also, also all other linear solution sequences. So here I want to explain in a big picture like what's the difference between this nodal penalty against our traditional segment to segment method, and we call it the distributed penalty. So in imagine we have two contact body. So this red body will touch in this blue one or glued to the blue one. So in this uh, distributed penalty, we call it DP. So these constraints are applied on this uh, polygon points that uh, this uh, blue cross shows. Whereas in this nodal penalty method, we apply these constraints at this nodal level. We basically integrate all the gap and penetration information over this polygon points to this nodal point. So the gap or penetration value we got at this nodal level is in an average sense. Whereas in the old method, this uh, gap penetration is just uh, this uh, is, is directly got from this polygon points. So that's the major difference between these two methods. And uh, so why we want to go to this uh, nodal penalty if we are going to use this uh, segment to segment method to solve our problem? Uh, we have uh, three big items here. So first is uh, the nodal penalty will give us better solution. Uh, this contact force will be more smooth. And uh, in terms of the uh, frequency analysis or model analysis, in those uh, uh, nodal penalty has more accurate uh, frequency spectrum. We will, you will find less spurious modes. So that's the like most nasty, nasty thing that um, most users try to avoid in using the old segment to segment method when it comes to the dynamic analysis. And the third thing is uh, the nodal penalty will behave more robust in the default setting. So in other words, user will has less, uh, he doesn't need to like tune this penalty to get the result he wants. So I'll show some example. So this is the first one. Uh, so this is the static analysis. And so on the top, this is the benchmark we want to match 
and it, this is modeled in a continuous message, so there is no contact. But in this below uh, picture, so you can see the mesh here is incompatible. So yeah, this is actually glued from four bodies. So we glue these four bodies together to make the same geometry as this one. And if we run this with the DP, you can see this bone misses stress is uh, completely different. The pattern is uh, completely off. And we can see it with this seg uh, segment to segment nodal penalty method. We can catch, preserve this uh, bone misses stress distribution pretty nicely and the max is uh, matching this uh, uh, continuous match result. So the error is so less than one percent. And you may want to ask why uh, this MP can do better. Uh, it's because uh, if we look at this contact force distribution between these two methods, you can see this DP, there are a lot of uh, spiky area of the contact force. Whereas in the MP, the contact force distribution is more smoothly. Uh, the reason why we have this kind of behavior is in the old DP method. We actually, when we build this contact matrix, it's actually over constrained because we apply this contact constraints over all these polygon points. So in the MP, we only apply the constraint of uh, this node nodes. So that's why. Here we got a more smooth and more physical reasonable result here. On to the next example. So this is to evaluate our performance in the dynamic analysis. So here, this is a solution 108 example in the frequency response. And uh, again, this green curve here in the upper picture, this is the result from continuous measures. So this is like benchmark. And if you can, if we, we run with the old SOS DP, you can see this uh, curve is uh, almost all the frequency in the lower range are mismatched. Away. Whereas in the MP method, uh, so here again, this navy one is a benchmark and the orange curve is or MP result. And you can see it can follow most of the frequency nicely. It uh, can catch most of the, the peak. And uh, so that's why you can, we hope user uh, will use our segment to segment MP method when it comes to the no dynamic analysis with more confidence. And then there are some comparison performance. So this is our model. One example we tested. Uh, so we have uh, 31 contact bodies and uh, 61 contact pairs. So in total, the time consumed in MP is a bit higher than uh, is uh, than the uh, DP. Uh, but if we break down this time in different category during the run, uh, you can find this contact. Uh, this GP4 model is actually, we construct a contact matrix and the total time is same. And uh, we introduce a new assembly algorithm in our MP method so that we can save the time in the matrix assembly. So you can see this uh, time here in the matrix assembly stage only that actually saves uh, like two seconds compared to the DP. But uh, the reason we want to do to do this is uh, uh, MP, we actually have more submatrix, and each submatrix um, may have more non zero terms compared to the DP in most of the cases that we have one. So, um, but the, still, we are slow in this read module. That's the real agonalio analysis. So, basically, the long shows, uh, we are spending more time in the long uh, to extract the eigenvalue. And the reason is, is because uh, the contact matrix uh, we are constructing is uh, more dense compared to the DP. So hopefully in the future, we can tailor our uh, 
the matrix uh, symbol, uh, matrix solver to uh, improve the performance uh, to make it um, at least uh, close to this DP runtime. So this uh, brief summary of the usage and the limitation. So user, what user need to do if we want to use a segment to segment nodal penalty is simply put this S2 as MP on the method field on AC para entry. And then it will run with a MP method. And of course, we only support permaglue in this release. And I want to emphasize uh, is this SOS MP is an enhancement method based on our existing segment to segment. It's not a completely new method. And so all the existing contact settings like the PC pair become PRG, become PRP, it, they all stay the same as a sequence as a set to set. We are aware of that we have seen a lot of issues with our current contact search algorithm in the segment to segment. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't improve that area in this release. So this uh, search logic stays the same in the MP as compared to the old the DP method. And one limitation item is nodal penalty method. We don't support one D elements defined in the contact board, like you have B or bar. But we hopefully we can remove this limitation in the next release. Okay, so the topic of my presentation is the SOL 400 bolt modeling uh, support for line and 2D elements. Okay, uh, as you know, bolt modeling is important in the analysis of structural assemblies where parts are joined together using bolts or rivets. It's used in wide range of industries and applications like automotive, aerospace, and general machinery. Bolt models also may, may be used in applications involving large rotations. 2021.4 20, release, we introduced uh, the, the new capability Bolt 1, uh, which supports SOL 400 nonlinear analysis and large rotation with advanced nonlinear elements. In the 2021.4 20, release, the, the applicability was limited to 3D solid elements. In this release, we we're extending the support to include line elements such as beams, bars, and rods, as well as 2D planar and shell elements. And of course, there are not too many applications for uh, bolts with 2D elements, but we are adding them just for completeness uh, in this case. The main advantage of the bolt one, as we uh, discussed in the previous release, is uh, no need to split the bolt mesh into top and bottom sections or duplicating the grid points around the bolt cross section, which this greatly simplifies the bolt modeling process, especially if the model has a large number of bolts. Uh, so basically uh, how it works is that the, the effect of bolt pretension, gap or overlap is simulated by an internal modification of the elements on one side of a cross section in the bolt. So we pick a cross section in the bolt and we pick one layer of elements on one side of the cross section and we modify these elements by, uh, by including the control grid point of the bolt in the connectivity of these elements. And, and this basically gets us the effect of the gap or overlap that we have get the same results as the other bolt, the original bolt model. The bolt modeling is further simplified by allowing the user the option to enter the complete list of elements forming the bolt. So this way he doesn't have to, to, to pick the bolt cross section or build the layer or pick the layer of elements uh, on one side of the cross section as well as he doesn't have to uh, enter the, uh, the bolt normal direction, which the program can compute internally. Okay, and as you said, the, the new thing in this release is that we're adding support for line and 2D elements uh, for this functionality. Okay, so the usage uh, stays the same as before, uh, no, no changes. We still have two methods to enter the, uh, the data for the bolt. The cross-section method where the user have more control and uh, he can enter the, the control node where he applies the pretension. He also has to define the normal direction of the bolt. Uh, he has to give the list of uh, grid points on the cross section, as well as a list of elements on one side of the cross section opposite to the normal of the bolt. 
And the second option to enter the, the data is the simple input format where the user only needs to give the control node as well as the list of the complete elements forming the bolt. In both cases, the user has the option to use set three to define the list of elements or nodes. So uh, as I said, the entry, the bolt one entry did not change. No changes here. Still use the to give the if you're using the simple input format, the user has to give the grid uh, ID has to use form equal zero for the simple input format. And just list uh, give the complete list of elements forming the bolt. If he's using the cross section input format, he has to use form equal one and give the normal direction of the bolt as well as the list of elements on one side of the cross section, as well as the list of grid points. Some guidelines and limitations. Bolt one is supported for advanced nonlinear elements only in SOL 400. It does not support Herman elements inside the bolts. The GP force output for the control grid still does not show the contributions of the cross section elements. We will improve this. I think uh, we have a plan to improve it. In future releases. And uh, another guideline is that the input and output for bolt axial force and displacement are along the first degree of freedom of the control grid, as we will see in, in the coming examples. I'm going to show a couple of examples. One is the pressure vessel assembly. Basically, the model consists of a cylindrical shell uh, connected with two flanges to a top circular cover and a spherical dome on one end. There are 42 bolts in this model, uh, modeled using C bar elements. And we have contact algorithm used to establish constraints between the different components. We have the typical uh, three loading steps bolt pretensioning, bolt locking, and then application of the loads. Here, in, in this case, it's the internal pressure and the structural weight. Just to take a little bit of the looking at the input, we're using bar elements, regular bar elements uh, in the model to, uh, to model the bolts. And for the bolt definition card itself, we're using the simple input format. We just need to give the grid ID and the complete list of elements for the bolt. In this case, each bolt is modeled by like seven C bar elements. And uh, the important thing to, to point, as I, as I said before, is that uh, when, when applying the pretension forces at the control grids, they are always applied in the first degree of freedom. And we have a comment about this in the QRG because the, we consider the, the, the control grid is a special grid point that has only a single degree of freedom aligned along the bolt axial direction. This slide shows the, the resulting the displacement and stress distributions for this model. Another example that demonstrates bolt one is capable of handling large rotation. We have an assembly of a, a solid block and a plate uh, assembled using three bolts modeled with uh, uh, beam elements in this case. The bolt heads and the nuts are, are modeled using solid elements. Again, we have the three uh, load steps, pretension and then the locking by constraining the bolt control grids. And then finally, we have a 90 degree rotation of the whole assembly by having a rigid surface connected to the plate, and then we rotate the rigid surface 90 degrees. Again, sample input. We model the bolts again using the simple method. And for the forces, again, they are applied in the first degree of freedom, regardless of the bolt orientation. So here, for example, the, the, the bolts are could be oriented along the, the Z direction, but still you apply the loads in the first uh, DOF. And for the stresses, we, we here we show the stresses before and after the rotation for the assembly, as well as for one of the one of the bolts. Uh, as you can see, the stress values did not change much due to the large rigid body rotation, which indicates that the bolt one capability is capable of handling large rotation situations. The project is thermal training from H state to H train. So this project extends current thermal training capability to support a steady state to transient thermal analysis using solution 400. So why do we have to do that? While modeling transient thermal analysis, the users normally have ideas about the initial temperature, initial thermal loading and boundary conditions. 
However, they may not know exactly how the initial temperature distribution. So as a result, they need to run a steady state thermal analysis with the initial heat flux loading and then use the steady state results as the starting temperatures for transient analysis. So current uh, next train approach requires two separate runs. First, run the steady state analysis and save the temperature results to a, in a punch file, and then read in the punch file as initial temperature in the second transient run. So the benefits of this project is to support the sequential steady state analysis to transient analysis in a single run, so that the modeling will be more com convenient and efficient because of less disk space and the CPU time. So the applications in aerospace industry include aer aircraft takeoff from ground condition to cruise condition and the satellite thermal analysis. In automobile industry, the, this project can be used to simulate engine heating and cooling, as well as climate system analysis. A typical application in electronics industry is the chip thermal analysis from cyclic heating. So the user interface for inputs in the case control section just specify analysis equal to step in, in step one and analysis equal to H train in step two. For outputs, the program will output steady state and transient results to different step record. So it is a little bit tricky to do the temperature boundary conditions for transient analysis. If they are constant, then the same or different SPC ID can be specified in step two with SPC bug data entries. But uh, if uh, they are time varying, then a different uh, SPC ID must be used in step two with uh, SPC D and SPC one entries. So this project is limited to solution 400 with one single subcase per model only. The IC case control command is ignored in transient analysis because the results of the steady state is used as the initial condition. This project does not support multiple physics with sub case control command. So here is a simple test case. It simulates a glass disk subject to sinusoidal solar heating. So the solar source is modeled by nonlinear, non-directional heat flux law on the top. And heat is lost to space at the bottom through the radiation exchange. The initial power is 135.3 watts for transient analysis. This thermal loading is also used in the first day, this day to get the initial temperatures. So at a time zero, the power is a sine function with a maximum power of uh, 1,353 watts. So on the left is a sample output. You can see using the solution 400 and then different analysis type in step one and step two. So here are the results. On the left hand side, display the counter plot for the steady state results. The maximum temperature 23.3 degrees C is located at the top edge of the disk. So on the right hand side, it is spread the XY plus of transient temperatures. So you may see the temperature distribution is also sine function. Here is the sine function for the node at the top edge of the disk. And when the thickness across the button, then the temperature just uh, decrease across the mountain because it's subject to radiation boundary condition, heat loss. This is about broadband uh, feature. Just a refresher, in 2021, we did uh, do broadband analysis, uh, just taking analysis of kings and offset to define on the rotor. So through the implementation, we had given um, outputs 
of the road bend, right? Uh, what we do in road bend is you bend the rotor, you put it into the bearing and then spin. So the initial deformation, the constraint we use for the analysis are all uh, given as outputs, but not in a standard form. It was just printed out in F06. So this analysis takes two steps in solve 400. Step one is a static analysis, and then step two is the rotor dynamic analysis. So the limitation of not having all the required internal geometries, constraint, and other outputs in our standard format is now cleared in this release. So all the limitation has been removed. So what we have now done is we have defined a new user interface, so same as the bulk data called road bend, with the option to print punch or plot. So this is a standard case control definition. So the formats uh, of F06 punch file and uh, uh, H5 is all supported now. So what you get now is the step one outputs of the rotor being put it into the bearing so that the uh, deformed uh, rotor geometry, uh, the constraint which we used to get that analysis, all that are now, which were originally internally done by Nastran is now given as a standard output for user to verify. Just an examples of the outputs is this is F06 where we print out the updated geometry, the constraint we use, the SPC and SPCD and uh, stuff. The same output in punch file is now being punched out as required. So the grades MPC, SPCD and stuff. And the same is now available in H5 format also. So this road bent implementation is now complete in terms of the user able to view all the required geometries which are automatically calculated by Nastran in their desired format. So this presentation is we will be talking about the new material model added into the in the SOL 400 solution sequence. This is a, a Kundball failure and material model which is developed by Ralph Kunch and Jens Pold to predict the unidirectional and open composite material. A failure for the thin shell as well as the solid cell element uh, structures. So in Kunch failure, we have two different criteria right now. It's, uh, if it is a unidirectional fibers and other is the woven fabric. A bold non-linear material model is basically is to it's a set of empirical formula which has a different uh, based on the loading type we uh, predict the reduction factors to the stiffness and we apply for the progressive failures so uh, this is a new material card uh, we have introduced in nastron so Right now, you can see there are here it says unidirection of woven. So, at a time, we can use either unidirection or woven material for the card, and it has almost 200 different parameters to, to define uh, this material definition. This material entry is a primary material property, so here it has to be unique ID as listed here all this it should not conflict with any other material id and another thing i have uh, enhanced is the nl out uses so with this material model we have like a various failure indices we are calculating so in nl out uh, we have a various additional output keyword can be added so, so right now we have added almost 10 different keywords which will give an output in FO6 as well as H5 or P2. For example, here, the, some of the definition is very much, I mean, uh, it, it, it's not generic to all failure theories. This is very much limited to punch ball failure theories. Okay, this is an example I've picked up. This is a, a lead solid composite plate and uh, there is a projectile hitting it the plate so the input card here you can see there is two different material for mat severe one is unidirectional one is woven 
So when we create a late composite, we define through P compilers a card and it has a various materials like what we defined earlier, like matcb1 and matcb2. So they are stacked in a sequence with a various fiber direction like 45, 0, 90 degrees. Also, I have added this NLOT request. So here I'll just give you briefly. This is a, a when projectile is hitting a plate. So it generates effort in in the it, it is defined through fail ind one. So this effort is nothing but is a, is a cumulative damage of the fibers. So if there is some empirical formulation to calculate the effort. The total effort of the material is behaving in different time steps like this. Similar to that, uh, I also added the one micro stresses on the same time step. So I'll conclude with my guidelines and limitation. Here, mat CV card can be used for only the composite properties like pcompilers and pcomg cards. If we are using mat CV card for solid cell, then same mat CV card cannot be used for the cell composite. Like pcompilers card and pcomg card should have be using a different mat CV card. User can here you can request uh, all the fiber failure enter fiber failure through NL out output request. Basically, what this slide is trying to say is that uh, if you have an external super element uh, defined, you cannot attach that to a um, another model with modules. It can't be assembled into a modules model. So what this uh, enhancement is trying to do is come up with this concept of uh, an external module, which then can be attached to a, a modules model. So here's the basic workflow of an external super analysis. It's uh, this is a, this is the same for whether you're doing an external module or an external super element. And it is currently supported in all the solution sequences that currently support regular modules. Uh, there's an extmd out command, which is almost identical to an extse out command. The requirements are the same. You need an ASET bulk data entry to define the boundary in module zero. Similarly, if you want to do a dynamic reduction, you'll need the QSET nest point entries or param model QSET. I should have mentioned that there. Uh, you can also define plot L's if you want to plot the results uh, graphically in, uh, in the assembly run. Also, in the assembly run, we can do two-step data recovery, so you can recover stress, uh, displacement, and so on for the external module. And you define the external module with the MD bulk entry, so almost identical again to the SE bulk entry. And if you want to reposition the external module in the assembly run, that can be done with the MD loc bulk data entry. So here's a very, very, very simple example. I just wanted to, to it's more like a unit test. I wanted to sim, you know, I wanted to test all the various export options that we have for for AXTMD out. Each uh, module there has four quad four elements. So it's cantilevered on the left end, load on the right end. And here's the, uh, I, just, I just included the creation run for uh, module three. And uh, the only difference between external super element creation is, the, is what's highlighted in red here with EXTMD out. And uh, so everything else is identical. And then the assembly run, I've, uh, um, do, I have to attach all the necessary databases or OP2, OP4 files for each of the modules. The only difference between this, if you were doing external super elements, would be the, the convert clause where the module, you have module here instead of SEID, but everything else would look the same in an external super element assembly run. 
these are the current limitations and guidelines. If you have modules in your creation run, we can't get the data recovery in the assembly run for those modules. O only module zero is recovered. And also I have a plan for importing external super elements. If you already have an external super element, say DMIT OP2 file or a database and you want to import, I have a, a method for importing that without doing another reduction run. Uh, also, in the future, we hope to allow repeated external modules, some load selection, just like we just implemented for SC load. Uh, also, three-step data recovery. So we're just, I, I, I just got more things to do in order to bring it up to speed with external super elements. All right, so next up is uh, Pam, one-dimensional analytical trim for Vibro Acoustics. Pam, a one-dimensional analytical trim offers an alternative approach to modeling multi-layered trim component. Uh, compare with the existing finite element-based 3D trim. In the method behind the 1D trim is what's called a transfer admittance method, uh, similar uh, to the classical transfer matrix method and based on assumptions of the trim material is locally reacting and the normal incidence of 1D plane wave traveling through multi-layers of material made of elastic, fluid, or poroelastic materials. And uh, frequency-dependent transfer admitted matrices analytically formulated for each trim layer. And then these matrices are combined to form the total transfer admitted matrix between the degrees of freedom at interface from cavity side and the structure side. And the train matrix is then projected to modal space for modal reduced impedance matrix or simply RIM. So with this 1D trim, there's no need to mesh the interior of the trim. So a trim is a model simply by a stack of multi-layers of different materials and the 2D meshes at both top and the bottom surfaces are required to define coupling conditions with structure and uh, acoustic domain. So the benefit comes mostly from the fact that there's no need to mesh the interior domain of trim. So obviously the model size is reduced. And also we have, we got an easier and a faster model setup for design and optimization. This is because we have fewer parameters and no need to mesh the trim. And because there's no interior meshes and uh, it is available for high excitation focus range, and uh, which is the limitation by the final element basis because the mesh size will affect the friction range for high focusing. The user interface, so we have a new bulk data card, AC PAM CP1, to define coupling conditions. And it's as a, it, if you look at the, the field, it's much similar to existing one for 3D trim. And also we expand existing bulk data card, TIM CPL, to define parameters for the coupling between trim and the structure and the trim with a cavity. And a new bulk data card, T comp G, is created created to define multi-layers 
of trim component. So it's um, very similar to the composite card, PCOMP G. So it, which define uh, layer thickness, materials, and the scaling factors. So in terms of guidelines and limitations, so for 1D trim, the modal approach is required. So this defined by param, TIM, BIM modal. And because of this uh, modal approach, so it is required that user use a disk equal all or disk equal set ID. The set ID includes all the company degree freedoms from both structure and the fluid in contact with trims. So in order to obtain the accurate results. So in copper G entries, so we strongly recommend that a unique set of three ID and the meta ID. And the 3D wave effect, such as bending, shearing, and uh, transfer dissipation are more important at low frequencies than at high frequencies. So 1D trim provide a better solution for high frequencies than very low ones. So a trim component can be modeled as either 1D or 3D trim, but it cannot be both. So this is the example for a NASCAR model with 1D trim. So the car body is not treated except in the dashboard area, which is covered by a two layer trim, 20 millimeter porous plus three millimeter heavy layers. Last slide is the result. So we have excitation applied at suspension mount and the output is the SPL or sound pressure level at the passenger's ear. So the right hand plus compare the results with just bare car model without any treatment and the results with the treatment at dashboard. So you can see obviously that sound dampening effect at the focuses after 100 hertz. It's why it's a HDFI performance improvement. First of all, HDFI performance improvement. So H5, we support H5, but we uh, have some issues on performance. H5 uh, write for the large models with uh, a lot of uh, subcase may take time. This one you can see when the uh, subcase has when the model has 245 su subcase with the stress and the displaced output. You can see uh, uh, the CRDB out is the module of uh, write H5. You can see this one uh, is the most uh, time consuming module. File size is also large because uh, we only support I4 for H5. Unlike uh, OP2, OP2 by default is, uh, is I4. So we provide the option of HDFI in I4, just like uh, OP2, uh, and also introduced a uh, fast compress method, also support GUI uh, for the new uh, I4 format of H5 and the input processing. So this is uh, the user interface of the HDF5 out. Uh, this is parameter and value pair. It's like a free format uh, with the keyword and the value. The first one is the precision. This defines the format of the uh, file. 32 means I4, uh, 64 uh, means I8. The default is uh, 32. So uh, next is compressed method. The LZ4 is the default. This one is very fast. So I will show you a benchmark later. We also have the none um, to no compress. GZIP uh, is the method so far we supported. 
next one is the level. Level is a compressed level. It's an integer from one to nine. Default is five. So we have other parameter. I'm not going to introduce that. And one thing is that the new entry HDF5 out will override the HDF release of parameters in MD, MDL param uh, entry. So when this is used, all these parameters will be ignored. If this is not used, you can use the, the existing one. But uh, maybe in the future, we, we are going to remove the HDF5 parameter uh, and also other H5 uh, related parameters. About the GUI support, uh, Python, Python will support the, the new entry. Python is fixed, the compromise is fixed by Python. It's, uh, it's LZ4. I think this is good enough. Uh, the post processing will, will support, uh, as you know, we, uh, Python post processing support uh, I8 format. So uh, this will be continued to support, but, but we also support the I4 format of the HDL5. What is different in I4 of HDL5? As you know, uh, in I8 format, all the integers are 64 bit. And the, the, all the integer, ah, real, uh, real values are 64 bit also. But in I4, uh, all integers are 32, uh, 32 bit. And uh, most floating point values are, are 32 bit also. Uh, the exception is uh, matrix data and some uh, or grid point uh, X, Y, Z of the grid point and some uh, expectations. You can find the data schema uh, file in the data type uh, underscore version XML. Uh, if it's defined type by double, this means uh, the real value is always 64 bit, regardless of the format. Uh, if it's defined real, this means in I4 form is uh, 32 bit and uh, 64 bit in uh, I8 format. So for the post processor uh, to know uh, which format, we provide an attribute to the file object. Uh, it's a name, is a precision. Why is a 32, uh, 32 means it's I4 format. Why is a 64 uh, means it's a I, I, I8 format. So uh, about the, the new filter, LZ4 and the Broska filter, as a compressed filter. Uh, it, it's transparent for users, so the user doesn't have to worry about that. Natural and Python will uh, automatically process that. But in the case you want to view the data, you have to set up uh, this variable, HDF5 plugin pass. It's a, uh, this shows the default uh, value of that. The installer won't set up for you, so the user has to set up this manually. So this is a benchmark. This is a big model, solution one one, uh, and the 200 subcases. The top side is a uh, time in second. The bottom is file size. The left side is I8 format, and the right side is the I4. There's so many pictures. You can see the gzip, the current we are supposed the compressed method, is a uh, is very very slow. Uh, here the I4 is the same. And you can see the LZ4 is very fast. In the IA form, even it's faster than no compressor, just because the file size is reduced, maybe. And I4, uh, and uh, the I4 format is, uh, is very close to no compress. And you can see the file size. The GZIP, uh, the LZ4 is faster, but the file size is also smaller. I4 and I8 are both the same. This is about the right. So how about the read? This is reader access uh, time. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, gzip. You can see LZ4 is still the best. Uh, the blocks uh, is, 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 is also good, but it's, uh, uh, the right performance is uh, LZ is the best. So uh, we set the default of LZ4 as the default. We are now in the process of uh, replacing encode with uh, CA fatigue solver. So in this release, we worked on two features. The first one was str out equal to four, where we get a stress scalar response time history in the F06. And the second one is the factor of safety analysis, 
where uh, we find out how much the the max and min stress can be scaled up or scaled down in order to reach a desired target life. So the benefits. So this is actually returned from the fatigue analysis and used in damage calculations. So it can also be used for debug and also to interface with any other in-house programs. The factor of safety analysis can be very useful, especially where components where the infinite life is predicted and it gives some kind of a measure of the uh, risk of failure uh, due to fatigue. Regarding the usage, since the only the solver is being changed, there's no difference or visible change for the user. The same bulk data entries and case control, etc. are used. Even there's no change in the F06 output or in the OP2, but in this release, we made a few changes, which I'll just show here. So in the case of STR out equal to four, encode output was also always in megapascals, but here we give the output in terms of the user given DTI units for stress. Also, and all the fatigue uh, results, they are always in the uh, terms of event wise. Whereas in case of ENCODE, the fatigue results are event wise, but for this STR out equal to four, they give it entity wise, that is one entity for all events and so on. So here we are retaining the consistency. And so we have the results event wise in this. And the, uh, the, the ENCODE actually reports the results in terms of the calculated target life, which actually has not much meaning because that's what the user is expecting. So we retain the original output as calculated by the solver, but we also report what is the factor of safety required for the uh, target life given by the user. So this is uh, uh, more meaningful. And also we report the result for event equal to all, that is the summed event. In this final section, we'll cover a couple of the miscellaneous improvements, both to do with nonlinear analysis. So we provide a utility to translate a SOR 106 and 129 deck to a SOR 400 job. The command is the MC version of the NL to 400 PY. This is a Python script. Actually, the source code is open to the user. So specify the 106 or 128 deck, and also the output is a solution 400. You can use the H option to print uh, some other common options. Here is this table to show how it works. The table is, is attached in the utility guide. And finally, we've deprecated some legacy capabilities in this release, including the legacy nonlinear solution SOR 600, which has been removed from the product and the documentation, the RC network solver, and some obsolete DMAP modules. And that concludes the MSC Nastran version 2022.2 What's New presentation. Thank you for your interest.